the naked eye. Go places you've never dreamed existed and learn more about how the world works. Let's start our journey at a coral reef. This underwater world is home to many different animals, including turtles, corals, and even sharks. Look around. How many animals can you find? You found a clownfish. Clownfish are immune to sea anemones' stinging tentacles and live among them for safety. You spotted the gray reef shark. Don't worry though, these guys are shy and usually ignore divers. Coral. Although they look more like plants, corals are actually animals. Reefs like this one are filled with marine life, but not everything in the ocean is visible to the naked eye. Let's enhance your vision with our virtual reality science goggles. Science goggles active. Initiating molecular visor display. Now what else is in the water that we couldn't see before? Can you see those purple motes? That is a carbon dioxide molecule, or CO2. Normally, it's invisible. You can't see, smell, or taste it. But what is CO2, and where does it come from? Take a deep breath in. Now, breathe out. You've just produced carbon dioxide. Whenever we breathe out, we create CO2 gas, and we aren't the only ones. Other animals also produce it when they breathe. In fact, all animals make CO2. This is what is known as regular CO2. When we breathe, we produce an amount that can be regulated by the Earth's natural systems, like plants that breathe in CO2. But today, carbon dioxide is produced by more than just humans and animals. It is also made when fossil fuels, like gasoline, are burned to power vehicles like cars, trains, planes, and boats. Fossil fuels are also used by power plants to make electricity, which we use to power our cities. Electricity generation is the single largest human-caused source of CO2 emissions. Press the buttons to see how much carbon dioxide each CO2 source produces in a week. Combined, transportation and power plants create much, much more carbon dioxide than the Earth's natural systems can recycle. We call this rampant CO2 because there's too much of it and it's getting out of control. Let's follow it further up into the atmosphere and see what happens there. Commencing atmospheric visualizer. With regular CO2, the Earth's natural systems are able to recycle carbon dioxide. But about half of all the rampant CO2 lingers in the Earth's atmosphere. Here it forms what scientists call the heat-trapping blanket. Initiating blanket visualizer. It's not an actual blanket, but so much rampant CO2 builds up in the atmosphere that, like a blanket, it traps in heat. I bet you're wondering, if the atmosphere only absorbs about half of the rampant carbon dioxide, where does the rest go? There's just too much of it to be consumed by plants, trees, and forests, so it ends up being absorbed by the ocean and other bodies of water. Let's return to the coral reef to see how the rampant carbon dioxide is affecting the ocean.
This is the reef as we last saw it, with regular amounts of CO2. Now look at what happens when we produce rampant amounts of CO2. The extra carbon dioxide makes the water more acidic, depleting the supply of calcium carbonate, a chemical that is needed by coral reefs to maintain their skeletons. This harms vital coral habitats, forcing the animals that call it home to leave if they are unable to adapt. We depend on the oceans, and the oceans depend on us. The corals are just part of a larger chain of life that includes humans too. And it's not just the fish we eat. Coral reefs form an important natural barrier between the open sea and the coasts. As they weaken, people living on the coastlines become more vulnerable to flooding and storm surges. Now that you understand the science, it's time to take off the science goggles and take action. Understanding how rampant CO2 affects the Earth's ecological systems is just part of the equation. There are hundreds of actions communities around the world are taking right now to reduce rampant CO2 emissions so our planet's natural systems can continue to work for all of us. Now that you know how the science of climate change works, you can see why action is so important. Share the science so others can defog their science goggles and take action too. Using carbon as an example, we see that it has an atomic number of 6. Looking at a carbon atom, we are expecting to find 6 electrons, protons, and neutrons. By taking the sum of the 6 protons and neutrons, we get a total mass of 12, otherwise known as carbon-12. When two neutrons are added to an atom, we now get an isotope. We can determine the isotope by taking another count of the total protons and neutrons. This time we notice we have 14, otherwise known as carbon-14. If you want to go over this again, click the repeat button. Otherwise, head back to the home menu to explore a different concept. Welcome. Please look around and choose a topic you want to learn more about. Using a mass spectrometer, we're going to carbon date this sample. Click again to continue. The first thing we do is vaporize the sample. This way, we can individually examine each atom. The heated coil then shoots out electrons. These electrons ionize the atoms going through, giving them a positive charge. To eliminate the acceleration variable for future calculations, all the atoms are passed through an accelerometer, which brings them all up to the same acceleration. The atoms now pass through a set of magnets. Depending on how heavy they are, the less they will bend. This means the carbon-14 atoms will bend a lot slower than the carbon-12 atoms. As each carbon atom comes and hits the panel, it is charted on the graph. Notice that where it hit the panel was dependent on how much it bent at the magnet stage. By looking at the final graph, we are now able to use the ratio of carbon-12 to carbon-14 atoms from our mass spectrometer and the carbon date formula to give a rough estimation of how old the fossil is.
Excellent.